Good evening, everyone. I hope you've had a good week this week, and we're glad that you're with us here tonight on Thursday in the Word. And, you know, we we cannot uh, emphasize enough how important I believe the Bible is, the Word of God is to us today. Uh, we're facing a lot of things in our country, and, you know, the Bible teaches us, well, a lot of things in the world, if you want to know the truth. Uh, the Bible teaches us that if we're going to be able to have discernment, we have to be able to be mature in the Word. And um, I believe the church is ill-prepared for what we're facing because of the fact that we do not know the word. Um, the Bible says we err not knowing the scripture. And so um, Bible study is important. We don't claim here, you know, to know all there is to know about the scripture. But, um, you know, we want to lay out enough scripture that we can support things that I believe the church needs today. And the church needs foundational doctrines. The church needs to have. The body of Christ needs to have a good, solid, firm foundation on God's word. And we, in order to have that, have to study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needs not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, 2 Timothy 2.15. So it's important for us to make sure we're in the word. And we've been talking now for a little while on um, concerning faith toward God. And also now we've been um talking about the doctrine of baptisms. And we went through uh, baptism in water, the importance of it, that it's not just a tradition or uh, a church ritual, but it is very vital and important to the process of our salvation. And that, you know, the scriptures teaches us in the book of Acts, as they walked out the will of God, the scripture teaches us that they baptized them after they repented in the name of Jesus. And so, we want to make sure that we emphasize to people the importance of being baptized in water, totally immersed in water, and come, going down uh, and being buried with Jesus and then rising in the newness of life. And we've also talked about and started dealing with the doctrine of baptisms, dealing with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Now, we know this is a very controversial topic, but yet it's important for the church today because... Um, I believe that the ba uh, baptism of the Holy Spirit is the superior provision from those who had been regenerated in the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints that walk by faith, they live by faith, they look forward to the coming of the Messiah. They were trusting God by faith. The Bible said that Abraham's faith was accounted as righteousness. The scripture teaches us they drank from the same spiritual rock that we drink from. That rock was Christ. But yet Jesus said there's going to be a change. The law is no longer going to be written on stone, but I'm going to write the law of God on your hearts. And the Holy Spirit is not going to be just with you, around you, on you, but he is going to be in you. And so that change has taken place and given to those of us after the day of Pentecost so that we would have a superior provision to fulfill um, the destiny that the church has in this age. And we praise God because Jesus said, because of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, he said, I will be with you even to the very end of the age. And so last time we were on uh, the broadcast here, we talked about um, Holy Spirit was predicted, uh, the record of the Holy Spirit being received, hindrances to receiving the Holy Spirit, and Holy Spirit baptism as a separate experience from regeneration and repentance. Uh, so tonight we're going to talk about um, and begin to speak on, uh, talk to you about have tongues ceased. Have tongues ceased. Do all speak with tongues? Has tongues ceased? What, has, what was God's intended purpose for tongues in the beginning? And are tongues necessary? It is our hope and prayer that in this Bible study here, we can eliminate a lot of confusion that has plagued many Christians seeking um, uh, the truth, and we can clear those things up, hopefully, and see many people receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit for this hour in which we live in, which we need to see the power of God manifest in even a greater measure than what we have ever seen before. And, and so when we talk about have tongues ceased, many uh, scholars agree that the Holy Spirit baptism uh, and that 
uh, it, it is a and that it is a scriptural experience. They they don't deny that it's a scriptural experience. They even believe that initially tongues were of God and had a place and purpose. But we do know now that many try to prove that the purpose of tongues has been fulfilled and therefore is no longer needed or valid um, for today. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, 8 through 13, it says, Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put away childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. To understand chapter 13, though, it's essential for us that we keep in context, that we keep it in context with chapter 12 and 14. 1 Corinthians 12, 31 and 4, through 14, 1. Let's, let's, take a, let's take a quick look at that. I know it's a lot, but let's take a look at 1 Corinthians um, chapter 14, um, starting at, uh, let's look at uh, 1231 and then move through um, chapter 13. 1231 says, but earnestly desire the best gifts. And yet I show you a more excellent way. Chapter 13. What does he say? Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become sounding brass or a clanging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. Love suffers long and is kind. Love um, does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there, be prof there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. And though as a child and, and thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then... I shall know just as I also am known. Now abides, and now abide faith, hope, and love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Pursue love and desire spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. When we looked at verses 8 through 10 of 1 Corinthians 13, we cited the proof that tongues were only for a time, uh, are cited as a proof that tongues are only a sign for a certain period while the New Testament scriptures are being penned. They say that the Bible was that which was being referred to in verse 10, which when that which is perfect has come is what that's talking about. After the Bible was written, there was no need for tongues. I personally feel that they had to take great liberties in, in, in interpreting the scriptures to come up with that. One of the first rules of how to interpret a passage of scripture is that we look at the passage in its context. There is nothing in the context of chapters 12, 13, or 14 that would lend itself to, to, uh, lend itself to uh, uh, substituting the Greek word biblos, meaning Bible, in the place of the phrase, that which is perfect. The reason for their assumption is because, because the word perfect in verse 10 is a neuter word and therefore could not be referring to Jesus and his coming. If I were to take the same liberties that they took, 
what would be wrong with my substituting another neuter Greek word, soma, meaning body, for the same phrase, since chapters 12 and 14 deal considerably with the body of Christ and the body ministry. And it would seem that this choice would be more scripturally uh, harmonious and plausible than the word Bible. If tongues were necessary only until scriptures were finished, then the apostle Paul who knew and wrote much of the truths of the passage of New Testament certainly would not have needed to speak in tongues. Yet he did often. 1 Corinthians 14, 18, he says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Now, I'm not saying that body is what was being referred to in the verse 10, but it is more probable than Bible. When we consider 2 Timothy um, 3, 16 and 17, it says, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Well, when we see that passage of scripture there, we know that he's talking there concerning Old Testament scriptures since the New Testament had not been written yet. The early church was built on the truth of the Old Testament, then it becomes our responsibility to rethink any notion that tongues were merely a substitutional replacement for the New Testament. To be quite frank, I am sure the early church would have rather had the presence of Paul who wrote much of the New Testament than they would the New Testament. That's a, that's a big statement. You can't ask a book questions about what it is saying, but Paul, they could. Another thing to consider when we talk about that is that, is that whenever prophecies and tongues cease, the scripture says, so will knowledge. It's ludicrous to think that knowledge has um, ceased now that the Bible is written. Prophecies, tongues, knowledge are partial. The partial will cease when the perfect has come. Has knowledge, knowledge vanished away? Of course, the answer is no. Then if knowledge hasn't vanished away and we're still seeking after knowledge, then should we not still continue to prophesy and speak in tongues? As we look at verses 11 through 13, we see the context really focuses around the issue of maturing unto perfection. The phrase now abides indicates that the perfect is not yet. When it comes, we won't need faith, hope, prophecies, tongues, and knowledge because we will be with the Lord in the eternal state. When we get to heaven, we won't need tongues. We will not need knowledge. We will not need prophecies. We will not need faith and we will not need hope. The only thing that goes on through to eternity in our lives is love. Love, faith, and hope is the only things he talks about that we need to have. But the greatest of these is love. Why? Because love endures all through eternity. I don't have to have faith for something when I am in heaven. I do not have to have any other knowledge or pray for knowledge because we will know all the things that God intends for us to know. And also, too, I won't need tongues because um, we will be there with Christ. There'll be no need for us to pray in the Spirit or to sing in the Spirit. Love never fails and never will cease to exist, whereas in reality, he defended its value, talking about tongues and, and use in 1 Corinthians 14, 18. Let's look at those. 1 Corinthians 14, 18 through 21 says, I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you. Nevertheless, in church, I would rather speak in five words with my mind in order to instruct others than 10,000 words in tongues. Brothers, do not be children in your thinking. Be, be infants in evil, but in your thinking, be mature. In the law it is written, by people of strange tongues and by the lips of foreigners will I speak to this people, and even then will, they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Thus tongues are a sign not for believers, but for unbelievers, while prophecy is a sign not for unbelievers, but for believers. He goes on in 1 Corinthians um, 14, 
27, he says, if any speak in tongue, let there be only two or three at most, and each in turn, and let someone interpret. He's talking about in a church service. Uh, we understand one of the reasons why we have such a bad view and a bad aspect or understanding of tongues is because of the Pentecostal and charismatic movements. Pentecostals and charismatic movements have made tongues the all in all, but also they have made tongues the three ring circus. But here Paul brings some clarity to a church that has gone completely off the charts because they had strife and envy and jealousy among them and they were respecter of persons. And they also found themselves, even when it comes to apparently this bat Holy Spirit baptism, they found themselves in a place to where they were being disruptive. And Paul says there's not anything wrong with speaking in tongues, but when someone speaks in tongues and, 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 and it is louder than everything else that's going on, he says, let it be by one, at the most by three, and let there be an interpretation to that tongue that is spoken. So that there's not what the Bible says is confusion. Verse 39, he says, so my brothers earnestly desire to prophesy and listen, and do not forbid speaking in tongues. 1 Corinthians 14, 40. But all things should be done decently and in order. And I, I believe that's, that's the big problem right there is that we have, we have witnessed in the church a misuse or an abuse of the moving of the Holy Spirit without fruit even. Uh, we've seen in the Pentecostal churches, we've seen total services that were total disrupted and taken over by people who are speaking in tongues and doing all different kinds of things. And there's and they celebrate that there's no message preached. Well, the Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. We have something more important than prophecy, something that's more important than us in a service, speaking the whole church away, service away by speaking in tongues. We have something more important. He said that is the word. And so when we celebrate that, it makes us sound like that we're more interested in that taking place than we are the word of God. But I, I want you to know God has called us that we would hear the word of God and hear the truth of God. And so he, te he calls us to do everything in decency and in order. It does not mean that we don't give way to the manifestation of God's spirit. It does not mean that we don't give space for there to be a message interpretation of tongues. It does not mean that the gifts of the Spirit should not have a place or a role to function and operate in the local church. But yet when the Spirit of God moves, I want you to know whatever takes place, there will be fruit from it. It will be edifying. It will be encouraging or lifting up. Not scare the hairs off people or cause people to run out of the place um, for their lives. And we, we need to guard ourselves and we need to stick with what the scripture is teaching us. And so we have to ask ourselves then, are tongues necessary? Speaking in tongues is necessary if it is initial evidence of receiving the Holy Spirit baptism. Uh, let us look at the scriptures to answer whether or not speaking in tongues is the evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism. Remember, Acts records the acts of the apostles are the practice or practices of the gospel message. Some piously say that the real evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism should be gifts and fruit of the Spirit. One must understand that fruit and gifts are not immediate, but usually manifest through growth and maturity. Whereas divine utterances are an immediate and initial, initial evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism. That is not something that we invented. This is something that we see in the scriptures. Acts 2, 2 through 4, and suddenly there came from heaven. Uh, a sound from heaven, like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were where they were sitting. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on them, each one of them. And there were and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Acts ten forty three through forty eight. To him, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. And while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. 
And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. How did they know? The next verse, verse 46. For they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commended them to be, commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain some days. That's not all. Acts 19, 6. And when Paul had laid hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they be, began speaking in tongues and prophesied. Acts chapter 8, 12 through 19. And when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. Now, when the apostles at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent to them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not fallen on any of them, but they had only been baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, when Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of hands, apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power. Also, so that anyone who, whom I lay my hands on can receive the Holy Spirit. All these things in these scriptures here are evidences of what happened to them. When Peter goes and explains as he went back to Jerusalem, talking about the, the believers in uh and the Gentile believers receiving the Holy Spirit, they ask him, how do you know that they received the Holy Spirit even as we did? And Peter confesses to them at Jerusalem, the Jews that were there, the leaders that were there, the apostles, the disciples, he confesses them because we heard them speak in other tongues. That's a big deal that we see in the scriptures, how they carried it out. In Acts 11, 12 through 18, we see that speaking in tongues was the only evidence needed to convince the very skeptical Jews then that the Gentiles had received the Holy Spirit baptism. That's what I was talking about when Peter went back to give an account of the ministry. It's important that we look at um, those passages and understand that Jesus was the baptizer uh, of those who were receiving the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Some people will use uh, and we'll talk about this later on, but some people will use um, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 13, 14 as the evidence that um, not everyone has to speak in tongues. We need to understand that there he's talking about the work of the Holy Spirit in somebody's life and the gifts. He's not talking about the gift itself. In the book of Acts we're, uh, 2, where it was pour, he was poured out, we're talking about Jesus doing what he had promised the disciples he would do, and, and the gift was the Holy Spirit baptism. In 12 and 13, 14, they're talking about and dealing with body ministry, but they're also talking about the gift that's being used there, gift of tongues, interpretation of tongues, laying on of hands, different things of that nature are gifts that are operated by the gift that was given because we know every gift that operates is operated through and by the Holy Spirit. In uh, Acts chapter 11, 12 uh, through 18, it's, and, and, and he says this, uh, I want you to look especially at verse 15. He says, as I begin to speak, this is Peter, the Holy Spirit fell on them just as on us at the beginning. And I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. And then God gave the same gift to them as he gave to us. We believe the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I that I could stand in God's way. When they heard these things, they fell silent. Because Peter testified to them what had taken place as he ministered to them the word of the living God. Some people argue in Acts 9, 17 through 19 that Paul did not speak in tongues when he received the Holy Spirit. By the same token, though, you cannot argue, you cannot back up the scripture that Paul did not speak with tongues. 
because when the Holy Spirit baptism was offered to those that were the disciples and in, in, in the book of Acts, they spoke with other tongues. Even Jesus' last words before he was taken away um, declares um, that the promise of the Holy Spirit baptism with the evidence of speaking in tongues and supernatural ministry would be taking place. When we talk about Mark 16, 19, and 20, he talks about the signs following in verse 20 of Mark 16 is in reference to verses 17 and 18 that talks about the signs, which one of them includes speaking with new tongues uh, would follow those who would believe, not for just a special group, not just for one or two, because we haven't done away with casting out devils or healing the sick or raising the dead or preaching the gospel. And so he said also one of these signs that will follow those who believe is speaking in other tongues. One might ask, why tongues, when considering why God chose this phenomenon to be the confirming evidence of the Holy Spirit baptism? 1 Corinthians 1, 27 and 28, and James 3, 2 through 8, offer some distinct possibilities as to the answer to this question. He says in 1 Corinthians 1, 27 through 28, he said, but God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. James states in 3, 2 through 8, he says, For we all stumble in many ways, and if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he is a perfect man, able also to bridle his whole body. If we put bits into the mouths of horses so that they obey us, we guide their whole bodies as well. Look at the ships also. Though they are so large and are driven by strong winds, they are guided by a very small rudder wherever the, uh, the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue, um, so also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great things. How great is a forest is set ablaze by such a small fire. So he's talking about this thing called the tongue, which is not easy to control. He went on and said, and the tongue is a fire, a world of unrighteousness. The tongue is set among our members, staining the whole body, setting on fire the entire course of life and set on fire by hell. For every kind of beast and bird of reptile and sea creature can be tamed <coughs> and that can be tamed and has been tamed by mankind. But no human being can tame the tongue. It is a restless evil full of deadly poison. So we can see the tongue is very difficult to, to contain or to tame. Since God places such a premium on humility, he often chooses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. Since God also wants to control the power resulting from and receiving the Holy Spirit baptism, he chooses the tongue which no man can tame or control to force our surrender to the only one who can control it, namely God himself. Some contend that tongues are the least of the gifts. Even if this were so, God thought enough of it that he provided it for the benefit of the believer. Now, I want to I want to say this. We believe, as we teach the Holy Spirit baptism, we believe that it is only the initial evidence. Um, the initial evidence, the identifier that I have received the Holy Spirit baptism is speaking uh, in other tongues. It's the initial evidence, not the only evidence. We know that we also see that somebody who is baptized with the Holy Spirit receives power for service, that they may go into all the world, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth, so that the kingdom message of Jesus Christ can be spread throughout the whole world. Power for service. It, 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 it is the superior provision given by God to those who have believed on him that they might finish the work that God intends for this planet, for this earth. God is calling us in this hour not to be left behind by anything that he wants to give to us. I want you to know, as I've stated before, so don't take it away from here as me saying anything else. Uh, somebody is just as saved, just as born again as I am, regardless of whether they have the Holy Spirit or not, the baptism of the Holy Spirit or not. 
people in this uh, in, in Christianity. Um, they are out here preaching the gospel, doing the things that God wants them to do, uh, just like I am, regardless of whether they have received the Holy Spirit baptism or not. But why would we want to live with lesser, less of a provision than the baptism of the Holy Spirit when he says it's not only for us, it's for our children and our children's children and for those who are yet afar off. All who God will call unto himself. Do not let the enemy, do not let traditions of men, do not let church tradition keep you from desiring and seeking God for this Holy Spirit baptism. God wants to pour the Holy Spirit baptism out on you right now. He wants to do it. And I'm gonna pray right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I want you to touch every person under the sound of my voice. It's not something that you have to reason out. It's not something that somebody has to figure out. But Father, right now, I pray in the name of Jesus that by faith, those that are listening to me right now who have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I pray right now, Holy Spirit, come upon them, fill them up to overflowing with the initial evidence of speaking in other tongues in the name of Jesus. Do a work in their lives and help them, God, as they need to be filled with the power from on high. God, I pray out of their belly will flow rivers of living water, which you spoke about concerning the Holy Spirit. God, in Jesus' name, touch everybody's understanding and help them, enlighten them, open their eyes and their ears that they can hear and see the truth. Let them dig into these scriptures themselves so that they can find what God is speaking to them. Father, I pray for them in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for joining with us tonight. And uh, we pray that you have a, gr a great rest of the week. And let's continue to focus our attention on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. God bless.